In this video, we're going to address cinema, video, and digital arts. Cinema as a term refers to the production of movies within the industry itself or as an art form. Originally, these videos were just a rapid sequence of photos, so as the subject was moving, they would move incrementally throughout the photos, and this would give the illusion of movement because they were shown in such quick succession. And this process relies on persistence of vision, which is very similar to an after image. In both of these, the image that you see or the stimulus that your eye receives, it remains on the retina even after the image or the stimulus has been removed. And in doing this, when you're seeing multiple images, it creates this appearance of motion. That's why flipbooks work. And children flipbooks actually first appeared in 1868. The first experimental color movie happened in 1933 and it didn't have any representational subjects, so no humans or anything that you could recognize. And the forms just moved and danced across the screen, almost like a visual poem. And generally, it was well received by the public at the time. Looking more specifically at when cinema and video itself started, we have to go back to 1872, wherein Leland Stanford, who was a politician, contacted Edward Moybridge to capture a horse in motion utilizing photos. And Moybridge was able to do this by having a line of cameras all along the side of a racetrack. And he took photos in succession as the horse and rider came in front of each camera. These photos also settled a bet about horses in full gallop because there had been no prior evidence that they had all four hooves off the ground at any given time. But we can see in the second photo of the top column that there are no hooves on the ground. In 1891, the first practical film camera is invented, and it used very long strips of photographic film, which were fed through the camera by an electric motor. It was capable of capturing about 16 frames per second. Later in the 1890s, cinema became a popular form of entertainment. It was often accompanied by other forms of art, like music, typically played by a piano. Though it was still not regarded as an art form, Early filmmakers tried to situate themselves within that context. For instance, they tried to visually emulate theatrical performances. As cinema became more accepted as an art form, its artistic direction and camera work became known as cinematography. One of the first directors to pioneer the effects of cinematography was George Méliès. He used what would later be called practical effects to achieve the seemingly impossible. He also used a series of shots which are brief, unbroken sequences of recorded action, with interesting dissolves in between them in order to convey a singular scene. He, like most filmmakers, also utilized film editing, which is where the editor selects the best shots from all of the raw footage taken and reassembles those bits and pieces into a singular, unified production that has more contextual meaning than the clips by themselves or in their raw state. And if you notice, this section is titled Silent Cinema, and again, we're looking at a series of photographs that have been sped up into what appears to be a video, so there is no audio at this point, outside of supplemental live performances that accompanied the video itself. During this time, we start to see the use of close-ups and long shots. A close-up is going to focus primarily on the head and face of a subject, and it's one of the most widely used shots today. And on the other hand, long shots are taken from a far away distance to emphasize either large groups of people or a panoramic setting, which we see in this example by D.W. Griffith, who was a major filmmaker trying to introduce the medium as a valid art form. He utilized both close-ups and long shots, creating a variety of perspectives within his camera work. He also used parallel editing in order to compare events both happening at the same time in different places or happening in different times. Cinema itself relies on the fact that the viewer's emotions are going to continue from one shot into the next, even if they're seemingly unrelated, and this is called the Kuleshov effect. Oftentimes, this is used when shifting from a close-up to whatever the subject is looking at, and then back to the close-up. So in this way, whatever they're looking at or doing, or whatever that shot is in between the close-ups, informs the actor's emotions. Sergei Eisenstein created another common convention that we see in film today called the montage. A montage is a combination of brief shots that represent distinct but related content. And in doing so, the editor is creating new relationships between these shots, either to build strong emotion 
or indicate the passage of time. His montage film, Battleship Potemkin, was one of the most powerful sequences in cinema history, and it depicts the tragedy of a failed revolt. It includes both close-ups and long shots that put the viewer in the middle of the violence and using the Kuleshov effect to build fear and anxiety within the audience. Four years later, in 1929, Salvador Dali and Luis Buñuel collaborated to create the work An Andalusian Dog. Using both of the conventions we previously talked about, it strung together sequences of seemingly unrelated and irrational events in order to create an event that resembles a collective dream or to represent an unrealized sexual desire. The film's illogical nature was later very influential to the hallucinatory content that we see in contemporary music videos. Moving on to the 1930s, we see a rise in movie studios. They grow into larger companies and begin contracting producers, directors, technicians, and actors. And these same studios actually went on to control a large part of cinema throughout the 1960s. It's also during this time that Hollywood becomes the major production site for a vast majority of the world's films. The Motion Picture Production Code tried to regulate the moral content of movies as the medium gained more popularity. However, in 1968, the Motion Picture Association of America introduced a new rating system, which is the one that we see used today. The movie Citizen Kane set new directing standards, and it did this by creating feelings using dramatic lighting or distorted lenses and dialogue that bridged the gap between different scenes. It also utilized clever editing to show the passage of time. And all of these conventions ended up creating the genre of film noir which was popularized throughout the 1940s after the release of Citizen Kane. This black and white genre of film had a dark and brooding tone and typically dealt with the dark side of the American dream, depicting things like murder and detective fiction. Animation was another form of creating film, and instead of just taking photos to project, it took photos of hand-drawn frames and then projected those, and then utilized the same technology to create an illusion of motion and these initial animations were led by Walt Disney Studios. In the same way that a drawing has a preliminary sketch, animation has storyboards, and these are a series of drawings or paintings that are arranged to convey the ideas, plans, and major shots that would make up a movie. In this example here of the film Destino, we see the storyboard on top and a still from the film on the bottom. Destino was storyboarded for eight months by Salvador Dali and John Hinch of Disney Studios. This went on from the end of 1945 to the beginning of 46, and while Hinch himself created 17 seconds of film, the project was deemed too expensive for the time period and had to be shut down. Walt Disney's nephew actually found the storyboard in 1999, and he later worked with Hinch himself along with 25 animators in order to create the film and release it in 2003. Looking at the international influence on the West, we see Akira Kurosawa. And this director is quite notable because he utilized long lenses and placed the cameras very far away from the actor. In doing this, he had hoped that the actor would give a more naturalistic performance. He also utilized a wide-angle lens to provide more scope for composition. And he did so with care, as if each shot was a painting in itself. He also paid really close attention to the motion of a scene. So it wouldn't just be the subject that was moving. Often he would make the background itself also be in motion. So far as the stories that he would tell, he frequently adapted European plays and narratives into his own works, utilizing techniques from traditional Japanese theater. The example that we see here, Throne of Blood from 1957, is a retelling of Shakespeare's Macbeth. Kurosawa influenced the West going into the 1970s so much so that the plot of Star Wars bears a lot of similarities to his own film, The Hidden Fortress. Moving from Kurosawa's innovative camera work and storytelling, there were also artists experimenting directly with the medium itself. For instance, Stan Brockage painted directly onto raw film, scratching through it to create abstract movies. In the top image that we see here, we see combined shots of the night sky, the surface of the sun, and a man walking his dog. And for Brockage, these images all come together to convey the idea of the creation of the universe. One of the first openly gay directors, Kenneth Anger, created the film Scorpio Rising that blurred the line between documentary and fiction. The work recorded the rituals of Brooklyn motorcycle gangs, 
using highly saturated colors and songs that were popular for the time. It was also intercut with movies and music to comment on the main action, and strongly influenced later biker movies. In the late 1960s, studios began to explore more formally restricted storylines and themes, usually as they pertain to race, violence, relationships, and sexuality. As a result, genres began to expand along with these new themes and styles. In his work, The Long Goodbye, Robert Altman reflected a lot of the old themes found in detective films of the decade before. But, while employing them, he also satirized and undercut most of those same conventions. So moving into the 1970s, we're seeing new genres while still ruminating on the foundations that came before. One new genre that emerged in the 1970s was the blaxploitation movement. These movies were mostly directed and acted by black people set within urban neighborhoods. And there's sort of two sides to these movies. On the one hand, you have more representation of black voices, black directors, black actors, but on the other hand, you're really only seeing stereotypical stories being told because that's what was able to be funded at the time. So, as the name suggests, it really did exploit the black Americans of the time. These were often set in urban settings with gritty yet charismatic characters, and again, they reinforced stereotypes, but the visual style, a magnetic lead character, and award-winning score would later go on to influence hip-hop culture. Another genre that emerged in the 1970s was martial arts films, which utilized practical effects like wire work, during which actors and stunt people would perform choreographed stunts while on wires attached to pulley systems, and it gave them the appearance of fantastical abilities or superhuman powers. These films began as English dubs, meaning that the original film was in another language, and then it was recorded over using English-speaking actors post-production. They came primarily from Hong Kong producers like the Shaw Brothers, Godfrey Ho, and others, and peaked in the United States from the 1970s until the 1990s, along with the rise in popularity of actors like Bruce Lee. However, as American filmmakers started to create their own movies, they began to cross the line of both cultural appropriation and exploitation, borrowing from a culture that they did not understand or share, often creating caricatures of it, while typecasting Asian Americans into those stereotypical roles, Again, great to see a rise in representation, but not as a reductive, two-dimensional caricature. Special effects is a merging of old techniques with new computer technology. For example, you have practical effects, which are physical special effects, like the wire working we just discussed. And then there are digital effects, which are added post-production, often using computer-generated imagery, or CGI. In both of these ventures, there are teams of artists and technicians who work together on the sketches, the planning, the models, the animation, and the sets, as they all turn into something that is impossible yet somewhat believable within the movie setting. Guillermo del Toro is very well known for his special effects. He uses the physical practical effects in order to create monster suits and sets, but then he also adds digital effects afterward to enhance the believability blurring the lines between the real and the imaginary with vivid sets and detailed lifelike creatures. In doing this, films like Pan's Labyrinth utilize imagination in order to help cope with adversity. As cinema started to be shot more digitally, it allowed for even more digital effects to be used in the film. There was also a shift toward more of a, quote, blockbuster style, which was characterized by luxurious digital special effects and fast-moving stories because this is what became more and more popular. One digital effect that we see very commonly in games today, but often in movies as well, is motion capture. And during this process, actors move around and act out scenes in a special suit that has markers throughout. And these markers document the movement of the actor and plot them onto a digital model, creating a more lifelike CGI. And this is because the movement comes not from being hand-drawn or observed, but directly from the naturalistic way that the actor is moving. Another digital effect is virtual reality, and these are movies, or again, more commonly games, that are shot within three dimensions. And this allows the viewer to put on a headset and experience these three dimensions by moving their head and seeing the action around them or the panoramic scene around them. The example that we see here, Hard World for Small Things, is a six-minute shot in VR. It puts the viewer in the back seat of a convertible as it drives throughout a neighborhood. 
and it ends with a vivid portrayal of a police-involved shooting. In this way, it functions very similarly to the montage film we addressed earlier, wherein the viewer is directly within the violence and the fear and the emotions and anxiety. But within VR, the viewer has a lot more authority and autonomy about where they're going to look and when, so it's much more reactionary and real and visceral. Video as an art form became far more accessible in 1965 with the release of the first portable video recording camera. So artists could be mobile and record on their own without a high-tech setup, but also they could create cassettes to share their work. Artist Nam Joon Paik utilized video both as his medium and his point of criticism. His work commented on the role of TV in American life, depicting it as the core of American national identity, which we can see in this top example here depicting the American flag through television sets. Diana Thader is another video artist, and she really plays with the environment that she creates around her video. So we can see here that the environment is lit blue in the bottom image. And this front room, where there's a video of living dung beetles, is also participating with the environment in this second room, where there's a cube that's underlit by a yellow light. As digital videography gains popularity and proliferation, artists start to blur the line between what's video art and what's full-blown cinematography. One such artist is Matthew Barney with his Chromaster Cycle. And though it's presented in a gallery setting, it is still a series of movies shot on digital video with portions of the third movie being released on DVD. The film series itself features elaborately symbolic storylines with expensive production values, wherein the symbolic content of each of the movies is more important than the actual plot itself. And though the film is art through the camera work and videography, it's also art beyond the video itself through the practical effects that the artist creates. And as technology advances, we see more use of computers in video, but also just more use of computers in art itself, as it extends into other media, expanding their capabilities. Rafael Lozano Hemmer creates his own digitally based works that exist in physical reality. In the example that we see here, viewers could program an array of powerful searchlights by visiting different terminals in the central square of Mexico City. And in this way, it allowed anyone to share in the responsibility of creating the work of art. Other artists focused on the computer's ability to utilize massive amounts of data. And one artist that does this is Casey Reyes, who utilizes software as his primary medium. The example that we see here is processed data that's turned into video art. So the video screen is connected to a database of one day's photos from the digital edition of the New York Times. So it gives viewers a new perspective on contemporary events by distorting them and layering them out slowly across the screen and what appears to be animated paint strokes. Lynn Hirschman Leeson is mainly confronting the human technological interfaces through topics like digital simulation, data, and surveillance. One such work, Technolust from 2002, is a feature-length science fiction film, during which a scientist invents several artificially intelligent robots. The subsequent narrative that ensues addresses the pitfalls of embracing technology too early. Agent Ruby is a real-world iteration of the AI that we see in Technolust, and this online AI can actually chat with users in real time. Another work that she created was the Dolly Clone series. In this work, the artist creates a doll that has a video camera in one eye and a webcam in the other, and they're connected to each other. So viewers can interact online to turn the other doll's head and survey the room that they're not in. But this surveillance goes both ways. So the viewer could be looking into another room without knowing that they're actually being watched as well. The work that we see here is Dina. It's a video cyborg that interacts directly with viewers by answering their questions and addressing their concerns. Her responses are connected to the internet directly and the program that searches in real time actually shows the text as it responds to the viewer. Now I'm gonna show you some contemporary artists who are working within film video art, and digital art. As usual, these will be very brief introductions, so I really encourage you to research the people that you find the most interesting. The work we see here is by an Israeli multidisciplinary artist who works primarily in installation, film, photography, performance, and public works of art. Their work deals with feminist themes and political themes, touching on topics like identity, culture, trauma, ritual, and displacement. 
Next we have a British director, filmmaker, and video artist. He's most famous for his film 12 Years a Slave, which came out in 2013, though he still participates explicitly in video artwork as well. And his works in general tell the story of underrepresented people and the struggles that they face. Next is a Chinese artist who utilizes video, film, photography, installation, performance, and augmented reality. Her work deals with capitalism, technology, and human internet cultural exchanges. Her work also addresses the U.S. social and cultural influence on China. Here we see an American activist and multidisciplinary artist working in film, installation, and performance with work that addresses concerns of the LGBTQ community through themes of gender identity and social situations. Next we have a Swiss installation, sculpture, and video artist who creates surreal and abstract environments. This is an American multidisciplinary artist using primarily video. Conceptually, he focuses on existential themes like birth and death or suffering and redemption. Another American filmmaker and artist whose work looks at the prevalence and representation of black culture in America. He compiles imagery from history, media, and culture in order to analyze their relationships. Here we have an Argentine-Israeli artist utilizing video, sculpture, and installation, whose work plays with reality and the surreal, investigating the physicality of existence from bodies and labor to objects and the stories that they tell. This next artist is Canadian and works with video, VR, installation, and photography. This artist utilizes interactive storytelling, formatted similarly to a game, to go through historical places and periods analyzing struggles and trauma. This next artist is Israeli-American working in video and installation, whose work uses conventions of documentary and fantasy and other genres in order to subvert the viewer's narrative expectations. This American film, installation, photography, and sculpture artist is most famous for her large-scale and site-specific video installations. So what? Why does any of this matter? Well, for one, we are surrounded by film. We grew up on film. Well, a major component of what it means to be represented or how you're represented, especially in regards to race, gender, ability, etc., starts with visual storytelling, particularly in movies and TV shows. How someone is depicted can give them the motivation or the inspiration to really fulfill something or it can give them a false self-conception wherein they feel like they can't do something or they're not welcome to do something. Or on the total other side, it can give people incorrect assumptions about other groups of people. So as a history, cinema has a major problem with that. Like most other art forms and forms of storytelling, it's usually pretty limited as to who gets to tell the story and who it's about. But beyond this, cinema also has a deep-rooted connection to technology so it's very culturally relevant right now. Especially looking at editing, like when we looked at the Kuleshov effect, that's not just relevant to cinema or art forms. The way that a news story is presented or the film that they present is edited can greatly influence the way the audiences interact with it. The same event can be represented in very different ways depending on which clips are used, what perspective is taken in the videography, both the literal perspective and the subsequent conceptual perspective, or how a singular clip can actually be edited or cropped in order to manipulate the narrative by two different sides of the same story. The conversation is very similar to the one that we had with photography. There is a sense of evidence or objectivity within recording something visually. That's what happened. That's, that's what you see is what you get. And sure, you may be depicting the same content, but different choices in editing and camera work function very similarly to language like its tones, implications, and cultural context that can manipulate viewers, even more so because the medium itself seems empirical. So film, video, and digital art are all integral to shaping our culture through both entertainment and our interpretation of recorded events. And on that note, I'm going to conclude this lecture. As usual, stay safe, get enough sleep, and I'll see you all in class.